We can find the electric field given the potential since we just have to take the negative spatial derivative and we can go backwards by taking the integral. We can find the voltage difference between two points where R is our reference point and P is our point of interest by doing the negative integral from R to P of E dot DL. Typically we take our reference point to be infinity so V equals zero there. Since E is a conservative field, that means only the endpoints of the integral matter. It's path independent. We had the same thing happen for the spring force and the gravitational force. This is how we can define a potential energy, and this is why when we look at the potential energy stored in a spring, all that matters is how much it's been extended or compressed from its rest length, and not how much back and forth had to happen for it to get there. Gravitational potential energy depends only on the height above the ground and not the particular path used to move the object back and forth around above the ground. Now an easy example here is the parallel plate capacitor. Since the electric field is constant, the integral is easy, we can find the voltage between the plates here as E comes outside the integral, we just get the integral between P and R. Now notice this is not the, the direct distance of the path, this is the distance between the endpoints because that's the direction the E field points in. The E will be perpendicular to the plates, so only motion perpendicular to the plates counts. We go from one plate to the next, we travel a distance little d, so our potential difference is E times d. Now look at the case where the field method is easy enough. Let's say we have a charge plus Q in between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor. We can find its speed after moving a distance d from just using A equals QE over M. This is force divided by mass. The field is constant inside the capacitor, so the acceleration is also constant, and we can use the kinematic equations from first semester physics once we know A, and we can say final velocity is initial or square of the final velocity is square of the initial velocity plus 2A times D. There's nothing particularly difficult about that. Now, what about this problem instead? Let's say we have a large free charge, we call it plus Q, and it's nailed down to some point in space. And we have a free charge that's smaller, plus lowercase q, nearby at a distance r1. How fast is little q moving when it's reached a distance r2 from big Q? If we want to solve this problem with the electric field, that means we have to integrate that non-constant acceleration along the entire path. If we instead use the fact that the voltage near Q is given by this integral, and since we have voltage at infinity is zero, that means the voltage is KQ over R1. So when we go from R1 to R2, which R2 will be larger than R1 since both of our charges are positive and they'll repel, that means the potential energy drops by this, K times big Q times one over R2 minus one over R1. Notice our change of potential energy is negative. We lose potential energy when it moves. The decrease in potential energy is balanced by an increase in kinetic energy though. So if little q started with zero velocity, it would end up at R2 with a speed given by one half mv squared is k big Q times one over the R1 minus one over R2. This m here is the mass of little q. Now, while we're talking about energy, it's a useful measure of it is the electron volt. We don't have to use the joule for everything. Sometimes there are more appropriate units. The electron volt would not be good for things like baseballs because it's uh, too small. It's, a, it's an atomic unit, essentially. One joule is 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electron volts. That's what this should say instead of joules. Now, the electron volt is so small because it's the energy required to move one electron charge across a one volt potential difference. That's tiny. We take the charge on the electron, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, multiply it by a volt, which is one joule per coulomb, and we get that one EV is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. We could invert that and we would get one joule is 6.25 times 10 to the 18 EV. Again, we have to fix this. There are multiple ways to find the potential with the charge system. We know we can take the gradient if we already know the electric field. We just have to take the directional derivative with respect to position. 
One of the advantages of potential, though, is it's easier to calculate, usually, because it's a scalar quantity instead of a vector quantity. Just like the most fundamental, though not usually fun, way to find the E-field is to sum or integrate kq over r squared in the r-hat direction over every tiny bit of charge, we can integrate kq over r over all charge to find the potential. Now it may look like this is just as bad with just this change in the exponent, but notice now we do not have the directional part, so this is really a much easier integral. If we have a limited number of discrete charges, capital N, we can write the potential as just the sum from I equals 1 to capital N of KQI over RI. Now we still have to know the sizes of the charges and how far away our point of interest is from each one. Not having to worry about the direction makes life much easier though. So let's look at these two problems. First we find the electric field at distance z above the ring of charge with linear charge density lambda and radius capital R. We actually did this problem earlier. So here's the picture and the answer we finally got, you could write it as 2 pi k lambda r z over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves or you could realize that 2 pi r lambda is the total charge and you could write it as kqz over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. This took a little bit of work since we had to get the components of the E field and remember that the horizontal component of this little piece of the ring was canceled by a matching piece of the ring on the opposite side. Only the vertical components mattered. What about if we wanted to find the potential instead? Again, if we say v equals zero at infinity, we don't even have to do an integral here. All the charges are at the same distance from the point of interest. They're all little r away, square root of big R squared plus z squared. If they're all there, we can say the sum of all charges is q, which is also, again, 2 pi r lambda, and we can say v is kq over square root of r squared plus z squared. So voltage is pretty easy to find. Now the electric field wasn't really that bad to find in this case, so it may not look like it's a, it's a big difference. Try it this way. Let's say we break this total charge Q into four big pieces of size Q over 10 and 12 smaller pieces of size Q over 20, and we essentially scatter them around the ring like this with no particular symmetry. The potential doesn't change. We still have the same charge at the same distance, so we get exactly the same answer. The electric field, on the other hand, would really be hard to do this way. I'd have to give you a lot more information about exactly where these charges are, and it would just be really, really unpleasant. This doesn't mean that voltage is somehow arbitrarily better than the electric field as a concept because they do different things. We can't find the electric field from the potential just at a single point. We have to find how the potential changes as a function of position so that we can take its derivative and then we'd be back in the same mess. So it's not that there's necessarily an easy way to get the E-field every time from the potential. Now, if we have the more symmetric case of charge evenly distributed along the ring, the voltage method will be easier. We would take the negative derivative of the potential with respect to height, so negative ddz of this, and that would give us kqz over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. That is the electric field that we found the harder way. Now we could also look at the much simpler case of a dipole. And students who take the junior level electromagnetism course are sometimes surprised by the time that we spend on dipoles. There are plenty of problems that involve monopoles, but not many with quadrupoles, octopoles, or higher order poles such as those. The reason is connected to the same reason that we don't start the, force, the course with F equals QE instead of Coulomb's law. The world is not made of dipoles. We know from chemistry that ions aren't exactly rare, but they are kind of a special case. In general, we know that atoms will have the same number of electrons as protons. The protons are all in the nucleus, and that's a reason, region so small that for ordinary purposes we can consider it a point. The electrons are kind of smeared out all over, and there may not be any bias to their positions, but if we took a snapshot at one instant and added their positions the way we would find center of mass, we would end up with a point where all the negative charge is effectively, temporarily localized. 
So we have two equal and opposite point charges separated by some distance, and that is a dipole. Now, we, that would of course be a fluctuating dipole because when we took a picture a fraction of a second later, the electrons would all be somewhere else. We could calculate the potential due to a dipole easy enough, but there's an approximation that's faster and is sometimes useful. We set up our coordinates so the dipole axis is in the z direction. Positive charge up here in positive z, negative charge in negative z. Separation between the charges is d and their sizes are plus and minus q. And we want to know what the potential is out here at this point p. We could find the exact answer using this r plus and r minus defined in the picture as k, q, 1 over r plus minus 1 over r minus. And we can use some geometry and trig to figure out what r plus and r minus have to be equal to. There's no approximation here. This would give us an exact answer. But what if we look at the limit where r is much, much greater than d? Why do we restrict ourselves to that if it's just a little bit easier? Well, the reason is, in general, this d is going to be something of an atomic dimension. So this may be a tenth of a nanometer. And we'll probably not be trying to measure things anywhere near that close to these charges. So usually, r is much, much greater than d. So it's worth looking at this approximation. If you go through the book, they set x equal to r sine theta, z equal to r cosine theta, and they do some trig, and they get that the r plus and minus are r times the square root of 1 minus and plus d over r cosine theta. So in other words, for r plus, we would use the top sign here, the negative, and for r minus, we'd use the bottom sign, the plus. We can then use the binomial approximation and expand this, and what we end up with is k, q, d, cosine theta over r squared. We can define an electric dipole moment, p, as q times d, and then we can write the potential as k, p dot r hat over r squared. Now notice the potential depends on 1 over r squared here instead of 1 over r. The field of a dipole we've already seen goes as 1 over r cubed instead of 1 over r squared. This is a general kind of result. If we combine two opposite charges to get a dipole, that's what this should say, dipole, the monopole term cancels out and the difference in the two monopole terms goes as the derivative of the monopole term, which is the dipole term. Combining two oppositely oriented dipoles would give us a quadrupole with the potential and field going as 1 over r cubed and 1 over r to the fourth. Now, there's an idea we've seen before that's also worth checking out. We know the electric field in a conductor is zero in electrostatics, and that's the first half of our course, our first quarter maybe. This means we don't have batteries or generators or changing magnetic fields. The charges don't move except when they equalize if we connect two items of a different charge and there's a little spark. Then the charges move for that fraction of a second. The reason here, we, we know the E field inside will be zero because the characteristic of a conductor that's important is it has free charges. They can move throughout the conductor. If we suddenly drop a charge in the conductor, we would produce an electric field, and free charges will respond to that electric field by moving until it's canceled. One way to think of this is what would happen if you scoop a cup of water out of an aquarium very quickly the water level readjusts to fill in the hole. The time scale for a conductor to make this readjustment is nanoseconds. So if the electric field is zero, what does that tell us about the voltage? It does not tell us the voltage is zero. Remember that E is a derivative, so if it's zero, all we know is voltage is constant. So in that case, the conductor is an equipotential volume. All parts of it have the same potential. Now, we can make up and solve problems with any charges we want. Are there any real-world complications? Yes, if we put too much charge in one place, we eventually have an electric field too strong for the air to allow it. We'll start ripping electrons off of air molecules. Air is like any other material in that it has a dielectric breakdown strength, and that's the point where when you go beyond this, an insulator becomes a conductor. If you can see a spark, that means the local electric field has broken down the air around it. And that breakdown strength for air is about 3 million volts per meter, or newtons per coulomb. 
This also lets you make a good guess at the voltage difference between two points in air when a spark jumps between them. For example, if you get a static shock in the winter and the, the length of the shock or the length of the spark is about one centimeter, that would mean the potential difference between you and the thing that shocked you is about three million volts per meter times one centimeter or 30,000 volts, which is huge. Now the gap between the electrodes and the spark plugs in your car is usually somewhere in the one millimeter range. This means your car has to supply a potential difference of 3,000 volts or more to keep your car running. And if you've been shocked by a spark plug wire, you know that that voltage is pretty high. In the static case, the voltage is high, but there's not enough charge being transferred to sustain a meaningful current for very long. The car is a little bit different. That can shock you all day long if necessary.